Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a blacksmith's guillotine. So today we'll be making a blacksmithing tool called a guillotine. Now the version I'm making is really going to be intended for bladesmiths, but it'll also work just fine for blacksmiths. The main difference between the bladesmith and the blacksmith uh, types is scale. You know, a blacksmith might want a bigger, more robust model, but the basic idea is the same whether you're making knives or whatever blacksmiths make. So what is a guillotine? No, not the thing used for chopping people's heads off. It's a tool used to whack little divots into steel, if I may burden you with excessively fancy technical parlance. Uh, anyway, for blacksmiths, they can be used for neck and hammers, upsetting small items, fullering, various other things. Uh, for knife makers, the obvious use is in setting the little junction between the tang and the ricasso of forged blades. Now this can be done with a hammer and the edge of the anvil, but if you really want crisp, predictable, symmetrical transitions, you cannot beat a guillotine for this job. I sketched out the basic idea for the tool in Fusion 360. It consists of a base which inserts into the hardy hole on your anvil. If you're new to blacksmithing, that's this little square hole here. Next, a couple of risers and two dies which insert into channels in the risers. Now these dies can be taken out and replaced with dies intended for other purposes. You can have fullering dies, rounded dies, ones that can create decorative patterns, cutoffs. There's just endless things you can do with them. Another way of making a guillotine uses a front and back plate rather than this rail or riser approach used here. Now that approach will allow you to use slightly lighter materials, but it limits the thickness of dies that can be used. With this design, you can put in big, fat, wide dies, and they go in and out really easily. I'm making the whole gizmo from mild steel. I'll start with the risers, which will be fabricated from one and a quarter square bar. Now I'm going to be milling out the channel for the dies to ride in, but I recognize everybody doesn't have a mill. So if you want to make one yourself and you don't have a mill, another approach is to weld a couple of flat bars onto each side of a thicker bar that matches the size of the dies. Same result, different method. Before milling the bars, I want to make sure that the base side of the dies is dead square. I'll do that on my grinder, checking with a machinist square. See, if it's not square, the risers will be in danger of being out of true when I weld everything together, which could cause the dies to bind up or twist. Once I've got my nice square face completed, I'll mark the other side, the top, so that I don't forget which side is which and weld them upside down. It's easy to do clever stuff like this and then forget which part of the part you did the clever thing to and you wasted all your effort. It is possible I might have done this sort of thing once or twice before. So these days, anytime I'm doing something like this, I always label everything. Hey, look, you want to build this yourself? As usual, I've made plans for this build with all the critical dimensions, which I'll post on my Patreon page. Help out the channel and you'll have access to dozens of plans for knives and knife making tools. Link in the cards and description. Now I'll put the first bar in my vise and then use an edge finder to set the edges on my DRO. Half the distance from one to the other gives me my center line. I'm using a 3 8 inch four flute end mill to mill out the slot. By moving over 1.3 inches after I finish that first slot, I'll have a channel that's just a hair over half an inch wide, giving me some wiggle room for the half inch thick dies to slide up and down in. Because these things will get whacked around and they'll be subject to a good bit of thermal expansion and mushrooming and different sizes of stock, I want plenty of play so that the dies will never ever bind up. Here I'm testing to make sure that that width is right and that it slides easily in the slot. 
as I expected, it works fine, so I'll drop down to full depth and complete the slot on a second pass. So the channel's 200 thousandths deep. I'll repeat the process on the second riser. The way I've milled this puts the channel slightly offset, giving me a little more access and visibility on the business side, but you could just as easily center it. In this case, though, I'll need to make sure that I offset in the correct direction or the true bottoms will end up in the wrong place and you'll have to fix one of them. Hardy holes are notoriously irregular, so I want to tailor the boss that will go down into the hardy so that I know it fits. When making hardy tools, the most important thing is you always want to round the corners so you don't end up wedging the tool into the hole. In this case, it slides in easiest from this direction, so I'll mark the side that stays out and the direction that the boss will be oriented. I want this as tightly fit as possible, but I don't want to have to take off material after it's welded on. It's really difficult to do that, so you want everything to be right before you ever start welding. The base will be made from 3 8 inch plate. Hardy tools made on plates often rock around because it's hard to get rid of the entire weld bead. The flatter it sits, the more accurately it works, the more efficiently energy is transferred to the workpiece, and the less cursing is required. So I'm going to gild the lily here and mill out a small pocket to rebate the boss and the weld bead into. I milled this 50 thousandths deep and about an eighth of an inch wider than the square bar on each side. Now if I were going to do this again, I'd make it a full quarter inch on all sides and maybe a hair deeper. It worked out okay, but you won't have to remove as much weld material if you make the pocket a little bigger than I did. Obviously, if you don't have a mill, you can skip this. It'll just require a little bit more and more careful cleanup on the weld. You might also notice that I've offset it to the side rather than sticking it right dead in the middle. This way, if there is any play and it doesn't lay 100% flat, it'll still bear a little bit more cleanly. If you have that boss right in the middle, everything's got to be 100% perfect or it'll really rock around badly. Now I'll weld on the square bar. First, a quick tack weld. Then remove the clamp and finish the weld. When that's done, I'll use an angle grinder to clean up the weld bead so that the base lies flush on the anvil. Now I'm ready to weld on the risers. I've cleaned up some of the mill scale on the base and flattened it a little on my belt grinder. I'm not too anal about it, but a little. Again, flatter is better. I'll put about four layers of painter's tape on each sides of the bar that I'm using as stock for my dies. The tape will allow me to set everything up with a little extra space so that there's room for the dies to move easily in the channel and if the welding causes any movement, I've still got a little extra space. I've clamped it in very lightly. I don't want to undo the work of the tape by squeezing it to death. Then, a couple of tack welds on all sides so that nothing warps out of place, causing everything to bind up. Then, off comes the clamp, and I'll finish the welds. After completing my flawless nuclear plant grade welds, I'll clean everything up with a flap wheel on my angle grinder. After cutting the dies to appropriate sizes, here's how it all comes together. My theory was to make the bottom dies go about a third of the way up the channel. 
You want as much mass as possible in the anvil section of that die, but you also want plenty of headroom so you can stick in different sizes of work. These are the simplest possible dies, designed, like I said, to neck the tang down on knives. They're just mild steel, which will work okay, but if you anticipate using them often, you'd be well advised to use a hardened tool steel. Speaking of which, you can do all kinds of other dies. These are just the simplest ones. I'll show some of them in an upcoming video. When that's done, I'll link to it in the cards and descriptions. Um, so that about wraps it up for today. Hope you enjoyed the project. I'll try to do a project or two in the near future where I'll use the guillotine. So if you're a little unclear about how this works, you'll be able to see how handy it is. Keep making those knives and see you soon. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon.